start recording now. So we're going to start back on the conservation of energy. We talked briefly about this last class, right, with the law of conservation of energy, where it says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. What happens to it? It's transformed into something else. Yeah, it gets transformed into something else, right? What, so I mean, when you look at the grand scheme of things here on Earth, the one thing that provides all of our energy is the sun, right? Because when you think about it, the sun causes plants to grow, right? It warms the earth, causes plants to grow, those plants grow, animals eat those plants or we eat those plants depending upon what you want to go with, right? We eat the animals, right? We produce waste, that waste helps plants grow, the plants grow, we eat you know, this whole cycle, but the plants can't grow without that sun energy, right? So the sun evaporates some of the water off the ocean. That water returns to Earth as rain, right? And it gets trapped behind our dam here. That dam has then a potential energy, that gravitational potential energy that goes down through those sluices, right? It uses the energy of the falling water. And then it travels down, turns those turbines. And that electricity comes here that powers our stoves, you know, all my computer equipment that I have in here, all that fun stuff. I think here in Vegas, we have to get a little bit better about conserving our energy. I'm trying to get better at it. That's why I replace everything with LEDs, although my computer kind of does the opposite of conserving energy. Um, but we're eventually going to come into a place where we're going to be, if we don't get more solar output, we're going to become in a place where we're in an electric negative. Um, I really think solar is our way to go here because like the sun, it's just almost always out. When was the last time we actually had real rain? A long time ago, land far, far away. I miss rain. Um, but it's it's really interesting the fact that and I, I was just reading a paper this weekend that was not written by a scientist, but that stated if we keep using solar energy, we're going to drain the sun of all its electricity, and then we're not going to have the sun. That that that's that's not the way it works. It doesn't work that way. Right, the sun's energy is going to hit us no matter what, whether it's going to hit the ground or whether it's going to hit the solar panels. But just because the sun's energy hits us doesn't mean that the sun's going to lose its power anytime soon. And if it does, we got bigger issues than worrying about solar power. Right, there's more energy stored in molecules food than there's in the reaction products after the food is metabolized. Right, we when we eat, in reality, we should eat to sustain life. Right, but we tend to also eat for pleasure and for depression and for whatever else, right? I don't think that eating at Thanksgiving is necessarily sustaining life. I think that's sustaining sleep. Because every time I eat in Thanksgiving, the next thing I know is I'm watching football and that's it, good night. But every cell in our body, so you gotta think about this. We are a great machine, right? But when you go down, there are so many machines in our body that let us function, right? All the way down to the, the cellular level. And we've got the metabolism system, right? The metabolism reactions slower, combustion is released as needed by the body, right? You guys will learn in AMP, and we'll also talk about in Therax 1, the introduction to Therax. You'll learn how the body uses energy from food to build ATP, which is used in the powerhouse cells as mitochondria and allows us to sustain our life, right? And we'll talk about the different way we use energy because sometimes we use energy aerobically, sometimes we use it anaerobically with oxygen, without oxygen. And there are byproducts to both of those. So we have green cell plants, right? Those green plants that contain one cell organisms allowed to combine carbon dioxide to produce sugar. That is why we should plant theoretically more vegetables, more plants, more trees, because those the more trees we plant, the greater chance we have of scrubbing those greenhouse gases out of the air, right? Um, Right, you know, I, I, I'm, I partner with Razer for a lot of my, so for those who don't know who Razer is, Razer is a very large computer gaming company. Almost every single piece, I can't lift it up high enough. Almost every single piece of equipment I have on my desk is from Razer. Um, but they're doing a plan right now where they're selling little plush snakes that I had on my desk the other day. And they're doing that to conserve trees in the rainforest. Because right now what's happening down at, um, down in the rainforest in the Amazon. What's happening in the rainforest? Does anyone know? 
Oh, look, there's Brooke. Rainforests are being cut down. They're gone. They're, they're clear cutting the rainforest because they're using it for wood, they're using it for other things, for development. And the Amazon is down to, I think, I wanna say it's down a third of what it used to be. And the Amazon's what scrubs a good, when you look at the forest across the, the world, the Amazon's one of the largest forests that scrubs carbon dioxide from the air. And we start cutting back on that, temperatures are gonna go up. You learned about photosynthesis, I hope back in, um, elementary school, I'm not gonna talk to you how to go through it, but that's the process they use to create energy, which we then eat. So we got sun, right? Solar power is really good. It does help with us. The sunlight is directly transformed in electricity by photovoltaic or vo voltaic cells. They get stored in a battery, right? When you have solar panels on your house, you can also, at least I know in Arizona, I don't know the rules here because I don't have solar panels here. I have solar panels in my house in Arizona. If you collect enough energy and you don't use enough of it, you can give energy back to the power grid. So over the past probably four or five weeks, my solar panels in Arizona have actually made more energy than I've used in the house because I haven't had the air conditioner on. And so I've donated energy back to Tucson Power and Electric, and they give me a credit on my bill because I give some of my energy back to the grid. And usually over the, you know, this time period up to about March, I actually get a credit on my bill that helps offset the ridiculous cost of air conditioning a house in summer here in this area. But that energy and sunlight helps generate electricity, right? Even, even just the way it works, it's kind of nice. We have that rain helps us. Everything causes us to go increasing in performance. The problem is the difference between the sun heating up solar or salt water versus fresh water. It's a lot easier for the sun to heat up fresh water than it is salt water because salt water changes that temperature to evaporate the water, right? Which is one of the reasons we're worried about the sea levels rising. If that water was fresh water, it wouldn't be as dangerous as it is salt water because the sun just doesn't evaporate that as well. But again, you go down to our, um, down to the, the Lake Mead and that, and you look at where those water levels on the lake and it's kind of scary now. It definitely is not where it was 10, 15 years ago. Wind, right? Okay, so wind is caused by the uneven warming of the Earth's surface. That's what causes wind to go through. And then we can generate energy through these through windmills. Um, harnessing the wind is very practical, for, uses almost no energy. The maintenance of those windmills are actually really low. And contrary to popular belief, windmills do not cause cancer. The sound, sound of windmills, if you haven't heard that, windmills do not cause cancer. Um, they can be a little bit problematic for the bird population in that area. But what the studies have shown is that after a few birds kind of suicide into the windmills, the birds kind of avoid the windmills. And a lot of the, the high altitude birds like the, uh, the falcons and the hawks and that like to build nests on top of the windmills because it's a nice safe place to raise their young. Fuel cells, right? Right now we're working on developing hydrogen, set, hydrogen fuel cell cars. That would be ideal. If we can develop hydrogen fuel cell cars, guess what we power our cars with? Water. Wouldn't that be cool to like your fill your car up on water? Be nice instead of having to do gas. Um, then the bi the best yeah right and the best part about that water is the side effect of it coming off is just water. So what doesn't get used just kind of goes out the engine and kind of drips out. It's a lot less polluting, right? And we're looking at a lot of those vehicles that can help reduce our overall greenhouse emissions. You look at certain countries like Brazil's on a plan to completely go um, fossil fuel free on their vehicles very soon. If not, they have already, I haven't checked recently, but I know they were working on it by like 2025. But we have the ability to do that. We have the ability to go either all electric, or all hydrogen cells, and even some of the taxis and some of the buses in town. Have you ever seen them that they're powered by natural gas or powered by electricity, right? And there was a big thing a few years ago, one of the cabs that's powered by gas got in a car accident. And unfortunately, the side effect is natural gas is flammable and it caused a pretty nasty explosion, but you know that was a one-off situation. So we can use electric current to break down hydrogen and oxygen. It's a process called electrolysis. 
it's exactly the opposite of creating a battery, right? We use battery to kind of do the reverse to power, our, you know, where's my cell phone at? Electrolysis in reverse is what powers our cell phone reality, right? But we can do the reverse by introducing a current into the water, which will then produce energy. The fuel cell, hydrogen, oxygen, our gas compressed, and all electrodes produce water and current. So the side effect is we have a little bit of water going off and we produce electrical current. Has anyone ridden in an all electric car ever? like a Tesla or anything like that. Yeah, and it's completely quiet. Yeah, I rented a Tesla when I was in Philadelphia and it freaked me out because you step on the gas and the car just takes off because it doesn't have to build up any energy. It's all powered immediately. And so I had to learn not to squeal the tires when I was starting. Um, but the car was a uh, funny story about that. I got pulled over because the guy, th the police thought I was operating a um, laptop in the car when I was driving down the road. But in reality, it was the center console to the Tesla because that's where all the stuff is in the Tesla. And so he tried to give me a ticket for operating an electronic device while driving on the road, which was hilarious. Um, but that's Pennsylvania for you, trust me. So nuclear, right? Nuclear. It's concentrated form. Yeah, exactly. I drive a manual Mustang, exactly the opposite. Oh, I drive a, tr a turbo or a uh, supercharged truck. So trust me. Mine's exactly the opposite of it too. But here's the deal. If I could get a effective electric truck that gave me the power I need to haul stuff, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Um, there's some really cool, you know, that test, although the Tesla truck looks kind of funky, I actually kind of interested in it. It reminds me of a vehicle from Halo. So I kind of want it. Anyway, so nuclear is one of the most, you know, available forms of energy, but also most unstable. Right, we produce energy from nuclear from the breaking down of nuclear materials like uranium, and plutonium. Right, so we have the Earth's interior kept hot by form of nuclear power. If we actually go down to the core, right, we think of the layers of the Earth. Right, we have the mantle, we have the crust, and we keep going down until we get to that core of the Earth. Really, the core of the Earth is nothing more than a nuclear reaction. We're sitting on a nuclear bomb in our planet, right? But the planet, everything's contained in there that molten lava, molten rock, by that spin, it's creating a geothermal effect. That geothermal effect we can tap into, right? It creates underground reservoirs of hot water, right? And we can use that hot water to power turbo generators. But at the same time, nuclear power is just as effective. Unfortunately, we talked about it briefly last time, nuclear power side effect is waste. What do we do with that waste? And you know, I was reading after we had class today, I was curious as to what some of the theories are. And there are some theories now that we're going to talk about loading up all the nuclear waste onto a rocket and shooting it at the, the sun, which I thought that was an actual unique plan. But that everyone's, you know, the talking, I was reading the, a forum about, they're like, well, we, how do we get enough power to get the rocket off the ground? Well, we only need to get the rocket into space. Once the rocket goes in space and you start it going, it'll travel forever in space. And the sun has so much geothermal, geoelectric energy that that rocket will never get near the sun. It'll melt up in the atmosphere. So that may be a theory in the future, right? There's also theories about sending our garbage up into space like that, which, you know, we're going to pollute the space now. Somewhere across the galaxy, there's going to be a rocket that lands full of McDonald's wrappers. And the aliens are going to come get us, right? It's horrible. <laughs> it is horrible. Let me think about it, right? Um, interestingly enough, where does anyone know where some of our largest reserves of uranium and plutonium actually are? It'll explain a lot in the Middle East if you understood it. Afghanistan. Afghanistan has one of a, a pretty large deposit of uranium and plutonium. The other one is the northern part of South Korea has some. And, you know, I can't see why we'd be in conflict over that. Could anyone see why we'd be in conflict over uranium coming from a country? I'm just saying, right? Where, where there's oil, we get into conflict. If there's uranium there, we're going to get into conflict as well, right? So you hear about this a lot because the big thing, taking a geopolitical term on that, you hear this a lot that Iran is mining uranium, right? They're trying to develop their own nuclear program. Mining uranium is not that big of a deal. 
right? Just pulling uranium out of the ground while it, yes, it's radioactive and stuff like that, it's not enriched. They haven't created a yield out of it where it's, re where it's actually starting to break down and cause nuclear decay. So just because a country is mining uranium doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. When you start hearing about countries enriching uranium, that's when they're starting to add extra molecules to that uranium in order to cause nuclear decay. And usually when we enrich uranium, we're doing one of two things. We're either making nuclear plants or we're making nuclear bombs. The second of which is probably the scariest, right? Does anyone know where we had nuclear meltdowns? There's been three major ones. Chernobyl is one of them. Chernobyl is one of them, right? In Russia, good. Where's the most recent one at? Uh, I think it was Japan. Yep, Fukushima, Japan. And then the other one is actually right in my backyard. Literally, it was about two miles away from my home in Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania. Right, and if any of you have ever watched um, the really, really bad Wolverine movie with the really, really bad version of Deadpool, when they land in that those giant silos, that was actually filmed at Three Mile Island because it's now a shut down nuclear plant, but we melted down there as well. Um, so we've had three major, the, the Three Mile Island one wasn't as bad, although we had five headed fish downstream for a while. No, just kidding, we didn't. Um, they, they, it's not as bad as it was. Fukushima is pretty bad because where did a lot of the radiation go? Does anyone know? The water. Yeah, into the ocean, right? And we're still to this day finding tuna with higher levels of radiation than should be, right? So there's some concerns that that could have a fallout for a while. If you've ever seen pictures of Chernobyl, it's very surreal. Like the pictures of what Chernobyl looks like, because Russia cleaned out the whole area. And there are people that still live there even after the fallout. And you, they do have mutant-like, not abilities, but appearances. A lot of them have, you know, really kind of gnarled skin and weird burns on their hands and stuff like that. But... You know, nowadays you can go tour Chernobyl if you wanted. I don't know that I trust that. I think I'll stay away as I'm okay. So geothermal energy, we talked about fracking, right? Or we didn't talk about it, but you've heard about fracking before. This is where we go down. We fracture an un underground pocket of that superheated energy and water, that superheated gas and water. We bring it up to the surface and pump it to provide energy, right? These waters put down there, goes against the hot rock, heats up. Steam comes up, that steam drives turbines. And we talk about this natural gas being very clean, this geothermal being very clean, right? It does seem innocuous enough, but there's some huge side effects to this. Um, if you look, so one of our big areas is kind of the Oklahoma, or Oklahoma, Nebraska area. They're starting to do a lot of geothermal fracking. Well, lately, they've been having more earthquakes than they've ever had. And it makes sense. If we're going to go down and start drilling into the earth where we have pockets of gas, it's probably going to cause some instability in the local environment, right? The other side effect, so this picture down here that I have is a great picture. This is actually from my hometown back in Pennsylvania of Scranton. And they're doing a lot of fracking there. And the, the residents can actually light their water on fire because there's methane coming because it got into the water tables and the methane is now traveling with the water and the water comes out, they can stick a match to it and lights up just like that. It's crazy to me, right? To think that that's a side effect, that, that the air, people in that area can't even drink their water anymore because of the methane levels. They all have to have bottled water and it's not even really safe to shower with it, but it does poison the environment. The side effect is again, even with geothermal, that water that we pump down there and that comes back up as the steam that we use to power the generators, that becomes wastewater. And we have to do something with that wastewater. And a lot of times what we do is we just dump it right back into the environment. You know, put it in holding ponds that gets down into the, you know, the groundwater and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. I think there was just a movie about that too. I seem to remember something about that. Could be wrong. So looking at it from our perspective, from physical therapy, our patients require energy to do tasks that we ask them to do, right? Oftentimes patients in the hospital setting fatigue quickly and are not able to perform the amount of work they would be able to do on the outside world. On top of that, they might not be able to generate the power to do something as lifting like a one pound dumbbell. So why are patients in the hospital oftentimes fatigued other than just being ill? 
what causes them to not have the energy to work for you? The medications they're on? Medications, okay, great, right? So medications go in and affect our mitochondria, right? So the mitochondria aren't using ATP as well. So overall, your energy levels go down, great. They're not getting enough energy, like input. Right, they're not getting nutrition. Has anyone eaten hospital food before? It's not exactly fantastic. It's not a, you know, it's not exactly gourmet meals. I mean, I'll, I'll give Summerlin. Summerlin has some pretty good food over there at Summerlin Hospital, but. Can it also be environment, like yep. sunlight? Oh. Yeah, exactly, right? They're not, we need, we need a little bit of sunlight. I don't really like sunlight, but we need a little bit to function, right? It helps synthesize vitamin D, which helps in energy production as well. But just being in an environment, you know, if you're stuck in, for, like th this disease is perfect for me because I'm an introvert. I tell me to stay home and not do anything. Please, no, don't threaten me with a good time. But for most people, they need to get out there more social beings. They need that interaction. And then you put them in a room where the walls are just this barren white and your mood just goes down. And we know that when depression kicks in, you stop eating or you start eating too much, one or the other, right? And your energy levels go down. And then your energy levels go down, so you start putting on weight. Because you start putting on weight, your energy levels go down. And it's just this vicious cycle. So if we're in the hospital, it would behoove us to encourage the patients to eat, right? It's so one of the things I, what I'm working on, especially in like the rehab setting that is I'm trying to make sure that my patients consistently eat their diet. That's why a lot of the inpatient rehab centers also have dietitians on staff to make sure patients are actually eating enough calories to do their work. If they're supposed to do three hours of therapy a day, they need to have the appropriate calorie intake, right? And this isn't just from eating a three pound Hershey chocolate bar. They need true nutrition, right? You need all of the vitamins to go along with it. So, you know, are we as humans 100% efficient? We talked briefly about this. Are we 100% efficient as, as engines? No, I see some of your heads nodding no, right? We're not because we have a side effect, even sitting here because again, I'm, I fidget a lot. Just moving this ball around, the energy that I'm using here, I can feel the, the stress ball heating up, right? I'm transferring some heat to the stress ball, both from friction and from the energy burning in my hand. So I'm letting off heat. That tells me I'm not 100% efficient. The other way you can show is if we eat does all of that translate into energy? No, right? Because we gain weight if we eat too much. Right. So how do you, how does the theory of conservation of energy apply to diets? Well, if you want to lose weight, your calories in has to be less than your calories out. Right. That's the most simple. That's that diet plan follows all of the theories of energy. We'll talk about it. Follows the laws of thermodynamics as well right? Your calories in have to be less than your calories out. And that can be a couple ways, right? You could cut down on what you eat and that will, it, that'll change the balance, right? But the other way that you can do it is increasing your exercise level. And if you do both of those, then you're kind of guaranteed. Portion control, exactly, right? Or what I like to call the most best, the best exercise a patient can do called a push away. It's where you push yourself away from the dining room table because you've had enough, right? And depends upon where you're from, you know, my, uh, my godchildren are Filipino and every time I go visit them, I swear they're trying to put 90 pounds on me. Like, you need more, you need more. No, I don't need any more. <laughs> Five plates of rice was enough. <laughs> I was like, yep. Yeah, I, I learned that quick. So I've got some assessment questions. We're not gonna go through that. Those are for you to review for your quiz, but we are going to go ahead and now go on to rotation. Let me bring rotation back up here. This is the lesson that spins you right round. <laughs> okay, fine, that was funny to me. I mean, I've been funny to you guys, but that's energy. All right. Oh my gosh, okay, fine, whatever. I decided to move around on my screen. Share screen. All right, so there we go. We got the PowerPoint brought back up. Let me get the chat. So we're gonna talk about rotation. And we may go, well, how does rotation apply to physical therapy? Well, 
what joints in our body work on the principles of rotation? We have two main joints that work on principles of rotation. Shoulders. Shoulder. Hips. Right, and the hips, right? Your shoulder knew that one. <laughs> right, rotational motion works there. But that doesn't mean even at something like a saddle joint in the finger, there's still rotation going on there, right? There's an axis and there's rotation going. So we're gonna talk about a couple of things, rotation, revolution, right? Torque, revolution was a great show, if you've never seen it. So circular motion, right? Which moves faster on a merry-go-round? A horse in the outside or the inside rail? Which one's actually traveling faster? What do you inside think? Inside rail? Okay, inside rail, why? I took a good guess. Took a good guess, I like it, right? Well, it depends upon our perspective. What about for if we're standing off of that, um, off of that merry ground watching it? From our perspective off the merry ground, which one's traveling faster? Neither of them, right? From a diagonal perspective, it looks like they're moving at the same speed, but when you're on it, because that small one's traveling, or the inside one's traveling a shorter distance, theoretically, it's moving a little bit faster. Right? Well, a hamster rotates about on its axis. Does the hamster rotator revolve? We'll talk about all this, right? So when we talk about circular motion, the two things we talk about are rotation and revolution, right? If we have an axis passing straight through an object, right? So straight through a circle. When it turns around an internal axis, that axis located on the body of motion, the object, the motion is called rotation or spin. When an object turns around an external axis, that motion is called revolution. And the way I've always remembered this is that there's external axis has an E as well as revolution having an E. So rotation is an external axis, right? Or rotation is an internal axis, revolution is an external, internal versus external axis. We're gonna look at that here with the merry-go-round, right? So here we have, what, what picture do we have there? The link. Yeah, the link, right? That's the good old high roller because we couldn't name it something normal. I'm sorry, you said rotation was internal? Rotation is internal access, revolution external, right? So Thank you. So you have the E, it's external. So here we have the observation wheel or the high roller down at the link. The wheel itself, right, is rotating while the people on the outside of the wheel are revolving, right? Because on the wheel, it's turning around its own axis. That's an internal axis. But we're all the way out here on the outside and we're going around an axis that is not internal to us. That means we are revolving. So if I stood up right now and was like an idiot and spun around in circles, I'm not gonna do that because then I'll probably fall. Would I be rotating or would I be revolving? Rotating. Rotating, right? Because the internal axis would basically be going down through my head down through my base of support and I'm going around, right? Now, let's say Diana and I link hands up and we start doing that thing we did as kids where you spin around in circles. Is that rotation or re revolution? Revolution. That would be revolution because we're turning around an external axis. The external axis being where our hands are linked, right? So, if you had some possibility, so let's talk about something like the teacup ride. Did you ever ride one of those on the, like the fairs or stuff like that, right? The yeah. teacup rides are usually one that, there's one, that I think it's a small world is also one of those rides, I think back at Disneyland. Disney. Yeah, right? <laughs> on that ride, you have a center object that's spinning the whole platform, right? Passed out on it. But at the same time, your car is rotating. Right? So your car is rotating while you revolve around the ride. Does that make sense? So it can really get, it can be attached by something, but in that case, there's not really an, an attachment for that, for that ride itself. It's more based upon the spin of the ride and stuff like that. But yes, typically it's going to be attached by something. There's not going to be an easy way. Like we'll talk about a string on a can in a second. So the earth itself, when the earth makes its turns and does the 24 hour period, is that a rotation or a revolution? Rotation? Rotation, rotation right? Now this, 
when it goes around the sun for the full year, that's a revolution because the axis is the sun at that point. And at that point, what it's attached to is gravity, right? The, the inertia of the sun is pulling us and keeping us in that spin, right? We talked about this briefly before, but if suddenly that gravity's cut off, the earth isn't gonna keep spinning around the sun anymore. It's gonna fly off in a straight line to infinity and beyond. So then that brings up, actually, before I go further, that brings up an interesting question. Why do some of the planets rotate slower than other planets, like Jupiter, where Jupiter has about, you know, I think it's a 200 day, 200 Earth day long day. Why does it take longer for that to go around? Could it be because uh, some of them are larger? Yeah, exactly. Mass, right? It's a simple thing as that. Right, so what started the Earth in rotation? Well, if you actually look at the, the theories of physics with that, when the Earth and all the planets kind of separated from the sun and started settling in, that pull of the sun sending us around the sun is what started the Earth also rotating. The Earth has a certain mass, right? You go down to Mercury, it's got a little bit smaller of a mass, right? So it rotates a little faster, right? But not that we're ever gonna land on Mercury because that would just be quite hot, right? I think it's like 60,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface of Mercury. Um, in, the, in the game that I work for, we have a plate, we had a whole area on Mercury. I'm like, you can't do that. Mercury would melt you. But whatever, it's fantasy, it's fine. So rotational speed, right? So we're gonna talk about tangential and rotational speed. Tangential speed depends upon the rotation speed and the distance from the axis. So when we're talking about tangential, right? If I say that, you know, my cousin is tangentially related to me, right? That means kind of looking at it from a distance. That's kind of the idea. We, we're related, but I hope that they're not really related to me is really what it comes down to. Unfortunately, I don't get away from them. So tangential speed depends upon the rotational speed and the distance from the axis. So we have a turntable here, right? That turntable is rotating. The ladybug on the turntable is revolving. Does that make sense? Because the ladybugs are kind of standing on the record and it's spinning around. Whereas, let me get my little drawer up here. So up here we have it, right? So this is rotating. The record itself is rotating. The ladybug is revolving because it's traveling with it. And it's on it. That's the external axis would be the center of that record move this out of the way. There we go. So when we're thinking about it, what part of the record moves faster? Well, it depends if we're talking about linear or rotational speed. If we're talking about rotational speed, the record is just moving because it's rotating, right? So linear speed is the distance traveled per unit of time. That's what the ladybug would be. So the point on the outer edge of the turntable travels the distance one rotation further than the inside, right? If we're on the outside of that, we travel a distance, right? Do you guys remember that there was a playground ride that I don't think you guys had it, but was that stupid spinny thing where you had handles and you could push it around in a circle and then you could all jump on it and it would just spin you around in circles? Well, how did you stop from getting as dizzy? The closer you got to the center of it, the less dizzy you would actually get because it would affect your vestibular system a little less. The further away you are, because that speed is changing, that linear speed, you're gonna be nauseated because you're increasing the, the speed of your ears, right? So linear speed itself, linear speed is greater on the outer edge than close to the axis because you're traveling a farther distance, right? So distance over time. I think we've heard that before, haven't we? What's that? John posted something about a uh, velociraptor. Yep, the velociraptor, exactly, exactly. That was fantastic, by the way, I loved it. I don't know if I send it back to you, but that's fantastic. I love, I love my little physics means. I've got a lot of them coming up, so you guys are gonna have to deal with them. And then if we're talking, so that's linear speed. That's the ability, to, that's just travel time, right? Rotational speed is the number of rotations per minute. It's usually in RPM. Where have you heard RPM before? Record player. 
Record player, good. Where else? Cars. Yeah, your car, right? You know that second gauge that no one looks at? That's beside the speedometer? That's your RPM gauge, right? It's telling how many rotations the internals of your engine are turning. And at some point, if you push it too far, what can you do to the engine? You can blow it up because it's not made to handle that many rotations per minute, right? Unless you're driving a Honda and then it likes to be out there in the, the red line area, right? All parts of the turntable itself, whether, you know, when we're looking at the turntable, it's all turning at the same speed. They're all rotating the same thing. So the rotational speed, where no matter where we are, stays the same. The linear speed is dependent upon how far we are away from the center of something. So let's take me, for example. I stand up and I spin around in a circle. Because I don't have an external access, can I have a linear speed? If I'm just taking, I'm just spinning around in a circle like this. Ooh. Be no. no, because the only thing I have is my internal access, right? Now, again, now instead of, you know, now I grab hands with Brooke and we spin around, holding hands and just spinning around in circles. Now we will also have rotational speed going around in circles, but we will also have linear speed depending upon how far we are away from where our hands are clasped. So if we pull ourselves in closer, then we're gonna have less rotational speed because we're traveling a shorter distance. We let go and go out farther, we're gonna be traveling a greater distance. So our linear speed will actually be greater. Doesn't matter what we do at that point, our rotational speed doesn't change because that's just how many times we go around in a circle. And you could base it off her or you could base it off me, right? You could say, oh, well, Mr. McKeever went around 30 times, that would be 30 RPM, right? Or in case of a record, 33 and a third usually is one of the speeds for records, right? For those of you that still remember. So records are these black things, or actually multicolored things that we used to play music off of. It's before the Microsoft Zune. Everyone uses one of those nowadays, right? I'm saying Zune and not have, none of you are like, what? I know, I'm dating myself. So no matter what, all parts of the turntable are gonna rotate at the same speed. Cause all we're talking about is if we put a fixed point on that turntable, how many times that comes around per minute? Doesn't matter the distance it travels. Now, if I put that fixed point on the outside, because it's traveling a greater distance, technically because distance over time is our velocity, it would have a greater linear speed. Does that make sense for everyone? Does everyone yes, understand sir. the difference between linear and rotational? Got a yes, good. Yes, yes. All right. Yes. Cool. So, and again, that's why if you get on one of those rides, if you're a person that doesn't like getting sick on one of those turning rides, the closer you move to the center, the less it affects your vestibular system because you're traveling a different linear speed, right? I don't know if they still have these, but back when I went to Hershey Park back in Pennsylvania, we had, used to have this thing called the rotator. And it was one that you got in the ride and it started spinning. And the big joke was to kind of run around it while it was spinning around a circle. And then it started spinning faster and faster until you were slammed up against the outside of the wall. And then when it had you up against the outside of the wall, it dropped the floor out from under you. And so you're like squished up against the wall going around in circles. And most people, when they got on that, usually got off and, you know, spewed chunks because their vestibular system just was not meant to handle that. At that point, the ride itself is rotating at a certain RPM, right? Those are fun, right? And you are revolving at a certain speed because of your linear speed. And you are going to have the greatest speed because you're the farthest that can get from the center. That's why it squishes you up against the wall. What would happen if all of a sudden they wouldn't bring that floor up, but slowed down the ride? You'd fall. You'd fall. Yeah, you just drop, you start sliding down to start with, but eventually you'd end up falling through the, the lack of floor, right? Because we're gonna talk about that centripetal versus centrifugal force in a bit. So when we talk about tangential speed, right? Tangential speed is the rotation, when we look at the, the relationship between that linear and that rotational speed. They're directly proportional to the rotational speed and the radial distance. So when we see a symbol that looks like that little squiggly line, that typically means directly proportional. 
meaning the further out you go, there is a ratio, right? We can say that if we have, right, let me draw here real quick. And we know this from, can I, do I have a circle shape that I don't have to, yeah, good, I don't have to draw a circle because I am bad at drawing. Uh, let's, can we fill that in? That doesn't let me fill in, whatever. All right, oh no, there's one. There we go, this one's a filled in circle. All right, so we've got a filled in circle here, right? Can I move that? Yeah, there we go. All right, so I got a filled in circle here. Uh, not text, stand, stand, draw, there we go. So let's say, so we have a center here. Oh, I got to change colors. You can't see purple on purple, can you? We have a center here. That would be the center of the circle, right? With circles from geometry, we know that the distance from the center of the circle to the edge of the circle on one side is called what? Diameter? Is it? Or I'm tripping. <laughs> I hear it. Hold on. Diameter, diameter is what? That's the oh. hole from one side to the other. Yes, from one side to the other. Half of the diameter is the mm -hmm. radius. The radius? Yes, right? So the radius. So we've got that, that we know the radius of a circle. What's it called around the outside? Circumference. Right, he's the scariest knight in King Arthur's court. Circumference, get it? <laughs> See? <laughs> so we know, we could say, let's just say that the radius of this is 10 meters, right? And we'll say that this halfway is five meters. Because the tangential speed is directly proportional here to that rotational speed, we know that someone standing, so if we put a person, we put a person at this five meter mark and we put a person all the way out here on the edge, how much faster is that person on the edge gonna be traveling than the person in the middle? Five meters? Well, it's traveling, yeah, five meters is the greater distance, but it's gonna travel double the speed in rotationals or in uh, linear speed, right? Cause double the radius, right? So we have, even without working on the, the math of it, right? We're not really gonna deal too much here with math, but we had, what is the velocity equal to again? Distance over, let me get out, hold on. Here's my eraser, because I wanna get a, something I can, you guys can, oh, that's not the eraser, that's the drawer. So if I put up a square in white, there we go, now I got somewhere to work. There we go, I'm good at this, see? So what's the velocity equal again? It's velocity time. equals distance over time. If we would classify this five meters as X over time, right? The person out here would technically be 2x, because it's double the distance. Does that make sense? So if it's double the distance, what has to happen to the velocity? Double. Yeah, it has to be double too, in order to make the sides equivalent. This is what it's saying why that there's a relationship, directly proportional relationship. Well, this seems like a lot of hocus pocus here, and how does this apply to physical therapy? Well, let me give you a simple example. When you're doing a curl, right? So I'm doing a curl here. Is there rotation going on? No. Think about it at the elbow. Think of like how the olecranon and- like half rotation? What's that? There's a hit. Like half rotation. Yeah, there's some rotation going there. What would the weight out here be doing? Would that be rotating or revolving? Revolving, 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 because my rotational axis is here, right? So my mm -hmm. forearm is part of the rotational component, right? We theoretically, if we could kind of spin it the whole way around, but we can't do that. I'm faking that. My elbow doesn't actually do that. So if I put the weight out here, 
that is going to be the hardest for somebody to do a curl with, right? Because my radius is longer. If I put a cuff weight here, it's actually gonna be a little bit easier because I've shortened that radius. That's how kind of this, because we're gonna talk about with torque. It's gonna require less torque to move the weight further up the arm. So this could be, this has happened before. I've had students where they come out and like, well, if I put a cuff weight on the patient at the wrist, they're able to do it. But if I give them a dumbbell, they can't curl it. That's because of the torque curve. They've increased the length that what we call the moment arm makes it harder. So that's kind of where this is coming from. That when you're talking about rotation, we're going to talk about torque and the force required to move something in a circle, right? All of your cars have a certain torque rating, right? If you ever look at your cars, there's a certain torque. We're going to talk about that in a second. Torque itself is nothing more than looking at how much does it take to turn those wheels on your car, right? The more torque you have, the easier it is to get those wheels to chirp. So here we're going to talk about this rotational speed and the kind of the, the um, relationship. We talk about velocity is proportional to the radius times the rotational speed. And that little emblem there is called omega, right? And then up in the corner, I have omega supreme from Transformers for those of you who don't know what it is, but I'm a total geek if you haven't figured that out already, right? Where the V is a tangential speed and the omega is the rotational speed. You move faster if the rate of rotation increases, right? So we could increase that speed by either moving further out on the record or making the record spin faster. At the axis of the rotational platform, you have no tangential speed. So if you're standing right in the center, so you get on the merry ground and you stand on top of the merry ground, right? You're not going to be spinning around because you're standing on the axis. Or you may, if you like, grab a hold of it with your feet and go around in circles. But the main center of the merry go round doesn't move. If it did, that could be dangerous. But as we move away, the tangential speed will increase because we're increasing that radial distance away from the center. If you move out twice as far, twice as fast. What if you move out five times as far away from the center? Tangential speed is five times as fast. Yeah. That, there is, that almost would be like a question that might be on one of the quizzes coming up. I don't know. <laughs> so in an amusement park, you and your friends sit on a large rotating disc. You sit at the edge and have a rotation speed of four RPM and a linear speed of six meters per second. If that friend sits half the distance away from the center as you, what's going to be the speed? The rotational speed is going to be the same. They're spinning around at four meters per second or RPMs, right? But her speed is going to be what? If the distance is half, the speed's going to be half. Good. I see people talking with the meat. That's OK. I got gotcha. you. I can read lips. So here's that concept of torque, right? And it's not torque. I had somebody do one of my previous classes. Um, like, I really got all the concept except that torque word. Torque? Parque? I don't understand. Right? Torque is the concept of force causing rotation. Right? Torque depends on a couple of things the magnitude of the force, the direction in which it acts, and the position or the point at which it's applied on the object. So we're talking about torque. The equation is torque equals lever arm times force, right? And we know, so, that, and again, you're not going to have a hard formula on this, so don't start freaking out about this one. This is just explaining torque so we understand it when we get into um, kinesiology, right? So we know that torque, right, equals the lever arm times force. We also know force, what's another, what's another breakout of force? Force is F equals MA, good, right? So really what this is saying is that the torque of an object, right, is depending upon 
the distance of an object is, and we're usually going to use the radius of something, right? Times its mass, times its acceleration. This is why if you go pick up a five pound dumbbell, you might be able to curl it. But now you go and you pick up a 95 pound dumbbell. And you're like, mm, no, not happening. No, actually, I know John would just grab that and just start curling it, but that's okay. He brings a ticket to the gun show every lab. Right? Well, why is that more difficult? Because we've increased that mass, right? We've actually made it significantly harder by a factor of 95. What is that, like 13 or 14? Anyway. So how could we make it easier? Well, let's say if we had that 95 pound dumbbell, we could reduce the lever arm, right? Shorten the distance from the radius. We could also slow it down, right? That's why if you see somebody doing light curls, they're usually flying through it, right? And then they get heavier weight. I know he's swole, man. They get heavier weight and they end up going slower. Well, why are they going slower? Partially because it's heavy. Right? But in reality, the body at that point is already going, okay, if I don't go slow, I don't have the torque to lift this lever arm. And even at our body, and we'll talk about this in Therax, our body has built-in sensors in the muscles that will tell us if we're using too much torque. Has anyone ever hit their fatigue limit when they're doing exercises at the gym? Maybe doing bench press or curls, right? All of a sudden, what happens? What happens to your arm? They turn jello, right? And it can happen mid curl. You could be up here doing this, and then suddenly the bicep is like, ain't happening. And there'll be a reflexive action that happens that all of a sudden the arm just drops. And you're looking at your arm going, why did that happen? Because you didn't tell it to drop, right? But it's a reaction in the muscle itself saying, if I keep trying to lift this weight, what's going to happen? You're going to cause an injury, right? You're probably going to damage the actual muscle itself. So the muscle is protecting. That's where we get that term guarding from. Me after lunches, exactly, right? Leg day, any day, right? After you're done at leg day and you go to stand up from your chair that you're sitting in, you're like, no, not happening. Um, the other day I had a lot, was, I was talking to a friend and he says, you know, it's really embarrassing how you know you're getting old when you do leg day. And then you go and use the bathroom and sit on the toilet and you have to ask for help up off the toilet. I'm like, yeah, exactly. That was my face too. I'm like, I'm just imagining him sitting there like, somebody help. <laughs> but why do they do that to us? Why do they put the super low toilets in the gym? That's just not nice. <laughs> Gives us extra work. Got to push life alert. Yeah, exactly. Trust me, I'm getting close to that. But it happens, right? We, we do fatigue and that's the muscles protecting ourselves, right? Yeah, I, I wasn't gonna help him, I wasn't there. He just told me the story because he was embarrassed by it, which I thought was fantastic. The same thing, can, there's a reverse action that can happen too, that your muscles, if you stretch them too far, will reflexively curl. And we'll talk about those two reactions when we get to kinesis because they're protective of our arms and our legs and our head and our neck and all of our muscles that exist. So it's all about that torque here, not twerk. Twerk something totally different, right? There's twerk and there's twerk. I'll only demonstrate twerk. I'm not gonna demonstrate twerk. I was waiting for you to say something about that. <laughs> You've only had me for half a semester and you already started to predict what I'm gonna say. That's scary. So here we have a guy turning a wrench, right? And this is why for guys, you'll, you'll hear us a lot of times that there's a couple of different wrenches we have. We have the normal wrench, we have the long wrench, and then we have the BMF wrench. The one that's got the eight, long, eight mile long handle, right? That's so we can increase torque, right? When you guys, has any of you ever changed? She got it, there we go. Have any of you ever changed your tire on the side of the road? Diana's now dying. Why do when we do, why do when we do those, those tools that we have in the vehicle, they give us a wrench that has like an arm like this to break the nuts on a, the, the side of the tire, right? The lug nuts. Why did they do that? They just make it hard for us. 
So how do you get those lug nuts loose? There's a couple of different ways. You can get a longer wrench, right? And some of them, the jack bar can attach to that wrench so you can increase your lever arm. There's another way. Well, that's part of it. You can also increase the mass pulling down on that. So what could you do on the wrench? You can stand on the wrench, right? If you stand on the wrench, you've increased the mass of the torque. So that will actually open up, that'll kind of break the lug nuts. Or you just wait for AAA to come and let them change it for you, one or the other. Kick it down, exactly. Joe, I've been guilty of that before too. So um, I came out of work the one day at, at the school and found out that somebody had decided to slash all my tires. And it wasn't until I was changing one of my tires that I realized and looked around and realized they were all flat. Somebody didn't like me. I think it was the homeless guy I keep kicking out from trying to sleep under my truck. They're like, it's a safe place to sleep. It's under my truck, get out from under my truck. You only slash two though, not the whole four. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's because he had to still get under it to rest. If he slashed all of them, it'd be too low. So he created a tent, a little bivouac for him. All right, so center of mass and center of gravity. This is important in physical therapy because these are going to come into play when we talk about balance, right? So you guys have learned a little bit about your systems. What system regulates your balance? It's got a cranial nerve named after it. Your balance system starts with a V. The vestibular? Vestibular system, good, right? Excellent, that's why you have the vestibular cochlear nerve, right? Did you guys learn your cranial nerves already? Have you gotten that far? Not yet. Oh. Not yet. Oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations are heavenly. It's a mnemonic for it. There's all kinds of other ones. You guys will remember the dirty mnemonics, not the clean ones that I give you. Um, the vestibular center, it's in your inner ears. That regulates your balance. We'll have a whole long class on that, like six hours long, and the other class loved it, let me tell you. They didn't want to stab me after we had the class. But the center of mass and center of gravity are important to that, right? The center of mass is the average position of all the mass of an object. Center of gravity is a position of weight distribution, right? Since mass and weight are proportional, the center of gravity and center of mass usually refers to the same point in an object. Our center of gravity, does anyone know about where our center of gravity is in the human body? What do you think it resides in? What bony structure? Hips. Yeah, the pelvis, good, right? Exactly. So our center of mass and center of gravity lays right in our hips. It's about S2 when you look at the spine. It sets just anterior to S2, right? So when we stand up, that becomes our center of gravity. What happens when I stand on one foot? What happens to my center of gravity? So I pick up one foot and I try to stand on one foot. It's going to shift over yeah. above that leg. So now my center of gravity is going to be in line with that, right? So let's say you went out to uh, Fremont Street, where all the mutants are. <laughs> you got free. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. That was a good one. Um, you got Fremont Street, and maybe you had one or two too many, right? And that alcohol is now thrown off your vestibular system. So you're weebling, wobbing all around. Or maybe your friend has. Let's say it's not you. You're just along for the ride. Because no one, none of us would ever do that, right? We're just there to help friends home. And all of a sudden, your balance system's off. What do you start doing to your base of support at your feet in order to compensate for the balance being off? Lighten it. Yeah, you start spreading. You kind of get that what I call the cowboy gate going on. Where you kind of spread your legs out, you puke on them, exactly. You so kind of spread those legs out and you increase your base of support so you have a greater chance of supporting your center of gravity, right? And then as time goes on, especially if you keep drinking, well, then all reason goes out of the way so you're no longer able to control that center of gravity. So now you're kind of ping-ponging off everything and you will eventually narrow your base of support because your brain starts thinking that's a wise idea. It'd be a really good idea if I fall right? Because logic goes out the window. 
So now you go down, you decide you're going walking towards your car, and all of a sudden there's a Las Vegas Metro officer there. And before he before you get in your car, he's like, hold on, you're not getting in your car. Come here, I want to do a field sobriety test on you. And you're like, um, hold my beer. Right? That's not a good thing to say to a cop, right? But so he takes you over and he's going to run you through a few tests. What are some of the tests the officer is going to make you do? Walk in a straight line. Walk in a straight line. Exactly, right? Usually heel to toe. And when you do that, what happens to your base of support? Really small, yes. right? Now you can't understand, your brain doesn't understand where your center of gravity is and you're kind of doing one of these, right? Or you walk in, you try to walk in a straight line and you walk like a cowboy again. What else is he gonna have you do? Touch your nose with your feet together. Right, so put your feet together and do one of these. Does anyone know what that's called when you, you're not able to do that? has a really cool name. So you he tells you to touch your nose and you're like poking the eye, in the mouth, forehead. That's called dysdidocokinesia. It's the problem with lack of alternating rapid movements. That's actually a problem with the cerebellum, part of your brain. That part of your brain is actually shutting down when you drink. And then one of the last, you'll maybe do the breath test, you're right. One of the last things he'll do for a field sobriety is have you stand on one foot. Right, he'll have you pick that one foot up and hold it up six inches and stare at your toes. Well, why is he telling you to stare at your toes? Because if I have you stare at your toes, you can't see the environment very well. So you can't use your vision for balance. And all of a sudden, your foot's up there for two seconds, <laughs> over you go. And then he takes your keys from you and says, I'm gonna take your keys so you don't get an out, a DUI, find a ride home, hopefully. No, they'll probably just wait for you to get in the car and nail you after you drive off. What am I saying? But all of those are dealing with the center of gravity. What he's doing is testing your center of gravity and moving it outside your base of support so you actually fall. Hopefully, you know, you've realized this before you get in your car and you don't do that, right? It's always safer to call a ride, obviously, if you're drunk than it is driving the car. That, all of that plays into physics. That's exactly what he's doing. He's trying to, see a hiccup, sorry, trying to move your base of support outside of your center, your center of gravity outside of your base of support to cause you to fall. It's not a very nice thing to do, right? Because you might fall and hurt yourself. And I wonder if anyone's ever sued for that. Yep, that's exactly right. So Riley says, it's interesting fact, when you have a blackout, the brain has permeated your brain enough that the hippocampus gets shut down. You're exactly right. And that's why you often make stupid decisions at that point, right? A lot of problem happens. We'll talk about how brain affect, alcohol affects your brain later in one of the classes. But it's amazing what that actually does to your brain. It makes you stupid, right? The, the old phrase of beer goggles is actually a real thing, right? That's actually, there is an actual effect on the eyes that alcohol has. But this is what I'm talking about center of gravity, right? So when we move those out, we end up falling. So we'll start next time talking about centripetal and centrifugal force, which is fun stuff. So let me stop recording here.